So in this lesson, we're going to be looking at parallel systems. Now, parallelism in uh, the A-level comes under a few different guises. Um, this lesson here, which is looking at parallel systems in general, thinking concurrently is where we um, use parallel ideas to solve problems. And finally, looking at GPUs, which although is just a parallel system, we, we treat it slightly differently. So let's get started. So we need to understand what was meant by a parallel system and its benefit and limitations, specifically knowing um, when we can use parallel systems and when we shouldn't use it. Understand the uh, different ways that parallel processes can be achieved, okay, and also understand the difference between running processes at the same time and a true parallel system, okay. So we're looking at actually problems that can generally be split up into different sections and then run parallel rather than simply running two probes at the same time. So although this isn't necessary for the um, A-level, it's actually a really useful way of categorizing different types of parallel architectures. It's known as Flynn's taxonomy. Now, um, the one that we are most used to of a Newman architecture is known as a single instruction, single data. What that effectively means is having a single instruction which runs on the processor, it'll then only work on a single piece of data. For example, maybe loading a piece of data, saving it, whatever. There are others, obviously. So uh, another one which is quite useful is single instruction, multiple data. Now this is the kind of architecture that you find inside graphics cards or GPUs. And what happens is it will run a single instruction, but this time it applies to multiple pieces of data at the same time. So for example, let's say you have a 3D model and all the points, all the vertices, um, maybe wants to be uh, translated, moved, scaled, whatever happens to be. And to do that, and we want to do the exact same calculation on each and every single warp vertex. Now, there might be hundreds of them inside a really detailed model. Therefore, we are going to do a lot of things at the same time. Okay? In a serial um, kind of thing with a single instruction, single data, we'd have to do each vertex individually, one at a time, in order. Whilst in um, single instruction, multiple data, we can do them all at once. Um, Multiple instructions, single data. Um, this architecture doesn't really exist because um, if you think about it, if I have one single data item, which is being applied by multiple instructions at the same time, we're gonna run the risk of the corruption. So that's just out of the question. The final one, which is useful, is multiple instruction, multiple data. And what this base means is we'll have multiple instructions run at the same time, okay, different ones. So that's a big difference from the SIMD architecture. We have one instruction running a multiple piece of data at the same time. Um, so you've got lots of different instructions running at the same time, but then they apply on different pieces of data. Okay, so this is kind of what you expect to see in um, a normal multi-core system. So these are the kind of our uh, ideas. So we are going to be focusing in only on multiple instruction, multiple data. This idea where we have different programs effectively or different sets of instructions running on different pieces of data and maybe later on bring all the data back together again or single instruction multiple data where you have single instruction running on lots of different data in the kind of same guise as a GPU. Now you might already have an idea of what we mean by a parallel system however it's probably a good idea to kind of really really be clear about it so imagine a system where we have multiple processors Okay, this might be uh, multiple cores inside a multiple core, a multiple core uh, CPU, or it might be you actually have physically separate uh, CPUs. As an example, if you had a server, you might have multiple processes which inside them have multiple cores as well. Okay, that's a that's a common kind of scenario uh, for a server. So if we have more than one processing core or unit or CPU units, um, then we can potentially run multiple instructions at the same time. And that's where we start to get the parallelism. Okay? So when we talk about power computing, we are talking about this idea of being able to run multiple instructions at the same time. So um, on the kind of diagram that I have on the screen, um, we have at the moment four CPUs. Okay? You can think of them as cores or CPUs, it doesn't really matter. And this P1, P2, P3, P4 business, I'm essentially trying to put across as processes, okay, different running programs. So as you can see, I've got four different programs running on four different cores. So they are running in parallel, i.e. at the same time, okay? So this is a very, very common scenario you'll find on a desktop computer. Um, it doesn't require any special programming. It just simply requires us to have multiple programs running at the same time. So that's kind of the idea we're thinking about. So how can we achieve parallelism? Okay, there's, there's lots of different ways it can be achieved. Um, the kind of list I have here is just some ideas. Okay, it's not a definitive list, I'll be really clear about that. Um, 
But one way is a distributed operating system. Now, this is where we have the different jobs of the operating system. For example, memory management, process management, network management, all those kind of things um, spread across multiple uh, CPUs. OK, sometimes even multiple computers. Um, CPU with multiple cores is the one that you're probably most uh, familiar with and almost every computer and mobile phone device nowadays will have multiple cores. So that's the most common way. GPUs um, are another very, very common way of uh, achieving parallelism. Okay, so very, very common uh, on most, most gaming style laptops, but also most, uh, and, and desktops, but also most computers will have a GPU of some description. Okay, and um, we'll be looking at GPUs uh, as a specific example in a different lesson. Or a multiple uh, processor computer. Now, um, these tend to be servers, uh, larger, more powerful computers um, where we'll have multiple processors and each of those could also have multiple cores. OK, um, this is only really necessary when we have um, have the need for massively parallel systems, ergo just just servers. So distributed operating systems are a bit of a, a, bit of a funny one, um, but long and short of it, it's a Distributed OS where multiple computers are drafted together to form a single logical computer. Now, um, so though we are talking about multiple CPUs, we're actually trying to bring together multiple computers. Okay, the ergo the idea of distributing. So again, uh, we'll have lots of computers work together. The uh, roles of the operating system might be spread around it, um, but ultimately these multiple CPUs of different computers can work together in parallel. Okay, so. Uh, an example of this might be if you had loads and loads of Raspberry Pis, okay, and put them together to form a more powerful computer, okay. Um, some research centres have actually taken this approach to actually do some of their research in universities. So multi-core CPUs will contain multiple processing units instead of just one, okay. So this is kind of common knowledge. Uh, well, hopefully it's common knowledge by now. Um, so, for example, if you look at the Galaxy S8, I'm aware this is well and truly out of date by now, but hey, hey, you get the idea. Um, it has an octa-core processor, eight cores, okay, which is massive for a mobile device if you really think about it. So that means it can run eight instructions at the same time, but that does not mean your apps are going to run eight times faster. What it means is it can run eight instructions at the same time. Now that is actually really important because most programs are not designed to work on multiple cores, they were designed to work on a single core. Okay, so it's, it's a different idea. Multi core CPUs will have a single CPU which will contain multiple cores, that's an idea. So now we're going to look at the parallelism inside GPUs. Now, this is going to be a discrete lesson later on because there's a bit more information you need to know about it. However, on the kind of basic idea, graphics cards um, contain. GPUs, graphical process units, um, and these will have thousands of uh, floating point units. Okay, so remember, floating points are decimal um, calculations, so floating point um, binary, for example, um, and they're very, very good at doing floating point mathematics, such as uh, trigonometry and things like that. So they're designed to do that kind of maths. Um, they can be used for general purpose uh, and calculations and, cal uh, and computing, uh, which is what we'll kind of explore as an idea in the separate lesson. So at the moment, I'm just really introducing it as a way of doing some parallel processing. So the last bit we're looking at is multi-CPU. Now, some computers, specifically desktop computers, will not only have multiple cores inside a CPU, they'll actually have multiple CPUs inside them. Now, um, these CPUs themselves may also have um, multiple cores. So, for example, um, the kind of process you find in server tends to be Intel Xeons. Um, so the E74820, obviously that just strips off the tongue, but that has 10 cores, uh, each running at 2 gigahertz. Um, these are um, designed to essentially allow you to do lots and lots of stuff at the same time, maybe, for example, inside a web server where you can uh, manage lots lots of user requests at the same time. Um, so if I had eight CPUs inside my server, each one having 10 cores, I effectively had a, uh, will have 80 processing cores to be able to work with. Now some of these ideas which is explored can uh, you can explore in a bit more detail. Um, the links on the screen will take you to some uh, videos. Um, so if you're watching this video, um, just simply type the links out. They are case sensitive. However, if you are um, doing this as my remote learning, uh, you can just click the links inside the OneNote. 
So this is a good time to pause the video and make some notes. Um, so it's really important you to define what we mean by parallel and most importantly, um, the different ways we can achieve it. Okay, so we've looked at three main ways, GPUs, uh, multi-core and multi-CPU. Okay, um, and this allows you to kind of like understand how we um, kind of set up the system as it were to do it. And each one um, is really used for different purposes. Okay, and that's already been summarized. You may wish to watch the videos from the last slide, so you're either typing in those links or um, going into the remote learning OneNote that I've set up for my school uh, to go through that. Now, parallel systems uh, are only of use if we're going to use them. So um, the next thing to really look at is how do we make use of these multi-core, multi-CPU, GPU systems. So there are two main categories of parallel system. The first one is enabling multiple processes to run more efficiently. So this is the kind of um, almost lazy parallelism, as it were. So you would have um, um, lots of different programs running processes on your computer, and each one will run on a separate core. So that's kind of the standard way we achieve parallelism without actually sweating too much. The other way is um, to take a complex process and actually break it down into parts, which each part could then run uh, in, in parallel. So this is the kind of um, uh, one that requires a bit more thought, a bit more programming. Um, if you watch um, a, a video called Thinking Concurrently that I've already released, um, this will explain to you um, how this is actually achieved, how we actually will go about coding this. But it's important, based on the scenario, to understand which one is relevant and how it may impact any answers you make. Okay, So understanding what is the problem and how it can be broken up. Another way to think about it is, is there something which would run independently inside the program? Again, this is the thinking concurrently part of it. Um, and we'll explore that kind of idea later. So single processes, um, some problems require vast amounts of pro process time. So it might be days, weeks, months, you know, it, it could be absolutely anything. Um, so for example, uh, 3D rendering, any form of 3D graphics will always take lots of parallelism, okay? And I've already kind of introduced the kind of idea why that might be the case. Um, so drawing 3D animations, uh, computer games, and things like that. So those require parallel processing. Even though it's a single um, idea, a single thing, um, we can break it down into small parts and then run those in parallel. Um, Scientific simulations or any form of simulation tends to be really good at parallelism. So to give you an example, imagine a flight simulator where we have lots of different planes flying around and uh, we are also maybe flying in that simulator. Um, each plane will be doing the same things. Okay, It will have the same kind of inputs, it will be going in a certain direction, but its calculations, what it's doing will always be the same. So rather run those in serial, we can run them in parallel because they're doing the exact same thing, but they're independent of each other, okay? And again, the key part about this is always independence. Each plane is independent of each other. Same will go for maybe a driving simulator, where each car will be independent of each other. So again, they're following the same rules, um, but can be independently calculated, ergo can run on a separate core. Data crunching, uh, anything that requires vast amounts of data crunching can normally be turned into a parallel problem. Okay, specifically, if we take the data sets it's working on and split those data sets up into smaller parts. Not every problem can be broken up in that way. Uh, again, the idea is, can I do something independently of something else? If I can do part of the calculation independently from another part of the calculation, well, then I can do those two things at the same time and maybe later on join the results together. So, if you are uh, interested, some, uh, the, the link on the screen will take you to a video which talks about projects which will take um, idle use of your CPU. So if you're not using a computer, for example, um, but it's still on, um, these will kind of kick up and actually start to run part of a, a data set. Okay? Um, the only reason this is of interest because it gives you some ideas of the kind of data crunching we might actually turn into a parallel system. So. In order for a single process to be split up, we need to be able to break up in smaller tasks. Okay? Each subtask will then be running on a separate processor. 
they might then produce an intermediate answer. So they, they might do a calculation and come up with an answer, um, but this not, might not be the full answer. So until we've maybe gone through the entire data set, we won't actually know what the full answer is. Okay, so we might end up bringing them back together. Now that bringing it back together might have to be done by a single processor, but because most of the work's already been done, that's fine. It's not particularly going to be a drain on resources. Parallel algorithms are really hard to write and sometimes require complicated OSs to manage them, um, specifically thread management as an example. Um, but ultimately, um, the key behind a parallel system is that independence of each subtask, like volume. Now, those kind of parallel systems have their advantages and drawbacks. Okay? Big advantages are, are fairly obvious. It can run faster. Okay, If I can break down a problem into smaller parts and those ones each run in parallel, it's obvious I'm going to get to the answer faster. Okay, um, It is always due to the fact they are running in parallel. Okay? They, they might be that they each core doesn't run any faster. However, because they're running together, they will get to the answer faster. So it's an obvious advantage. Disadvantage, however, is uh, you will need a more uh, advanced operating system to be able to synchronize these threads, these, these parallel uh, processes. Without that, um, they, they, they won't synchronize properly. Parallel algorithms are hard to coach. You have to think about the problem very differently. As programmers, we're very much used to solving problems by starting at the beginning and working our way down. However, in this kind of scenario, um, we have to break it down into parts first and then do them in, in parallel. So the four processes are different and it's just a little bit more challenge to actually do that. A single processor will always be needed at the end. So um, uh, once each individual compute unit has been done, we will need to bring the answer back together at the end of it. So without that system, uh, we won't be able to get to a final answer. So ultimately at some point, we still have to kind of do some serial processing. So just to kind of recap what we looked at already. There are two main approaches uh, to parallel processing. The signal instruction multiple data approach, where we have a large data set that we have to process, and each data set requires the same calculations being run on each one. So that's the kind of approach that a GPU might run. And then you've got uh, multiple instruction, multiple data. And this is kind of where we have different processes or different parts of a program which uh, maybe aren't the same, require different instructions to be run at the same time. Um, those kind of ones will be better off using multiple cores or multiple CPUs. So the next thing to really look at is to expand your notes a little bit with examples of how these um, different approaches are used. So find one example um, of a system which requires parallel processing. Now this could be simulations or 3D graphics or anything like that. And then explain how power processes can be achieved using it. Okay. So what I don't mean is how you're going to code it. What I mean is um, how can you use parallel processing software. So if we're looking at, for example, um, maybe a driving simulator. Okay. The way we can achieve power processing is each kind of car within the simulation or each uh, pedestrian in the simulation or whatever happens to be can each run the same set of instructions, same algorithm, and then those can be run in parallel with one another because they're all kind of be working independently um, like that. Once you've done that, think about the advantage disadvantage of power processing and then apply it to the context. So for example, in a kind of driving simulation, one of the advantages is it's going to be faster. Okay. If each of the uh, cars and the pedestrians, all those kind of individual parts are all running at the same time, it means I can have a more realistic simulation to put more things into it, and it's going to run a lot smoother and almost in real time. Obviously, the disadvantages of it is that it's going to be much more difficult to code, um, and it's also um, going to um, require me to very, very carefully plan out which bits I can run in parallel, for example, the different cars, and which bits I can't, kind of like synchronizing them all inside the world. So the next thing to look at is multitasking. Now, um, multitasking multiple cores um, sometimes feel a little bit different, okay? Um, but actually, multitasking where we have multiple processes running on the same system, but a limited number of cores to run them on still holds fruit, regardless of how many cores you've got. 
Um, the average kind of uh, um, operating system will have many more processes running than you actually would even expect. Um, sometimes it's it's an interesting kind of task to open up Task Manager or Activity Monitor or whatever tool you use to see what process are running on your system um, and actually go into detail, see what exactly what those processes are and you'll see those lows in there that you wouldn't even thought would, would be there. So with that in mind, um, we are going to have a situation where there's lots lots of processes running on a single uh, system and we're going to have a limbs number called number 2, 4, 8, whatever it happens to be. Because of that, um, each process will have to um, be assigned a call to run on. And the operators will then decide well, which process runs on which core. So, for example, imagine we have this scenario. We have um, maybe process 1, 3 and 5 running on core 1, and then the other process running on core 2. Okay, So we kind of have that load balancing. Now, that's not multitasking yet but it is allowing multiple calls to be run. So the scheduler that's going to be scheduling which process runs at any given point will have to decide not only which core is it going to run, then also which order it's going to run in. Now here in this, this scenario, each core has three processes running on it, which means that um, we still have to run scheduling, we still have to implement multi-task. Um, the more cores we have, the less, um, less waiting time each process has, okay? So in this scenario, I've got four cores, so I can split these up and, um, and maybe split up like this with um, core one and three or two processes and the other two cores with only one, okay? Um, scheduling, again, will still kick in on this one, um, and that is something that we will study or have studied, depending on the audio watches videos in, um, in the operating system unit, looking at things like first come, first served, shortage job first, etc. 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 So obviously some advantages and disadvantages of using multitasking. Okay, first of all, most modern um, systems will have many, many, many processes running, okay, at the same time. Some of them you have opened yourself, some of them will be background processes. Um, having those run in parallel is a massive speed boost. Because swapping in and out of the CPU will have some overhead, so it takes a little bit of time, uh, a few clock cycles to actually take a process out of the CPU and put a new one into it. Um, that overhead, um, if I swap less, i.e. I've got more cores and those are running process in parallel, which means I don't have to swap as much to get a thing done, um, that overhead is reduced and ergo the system performance improves. Some disadvantages, well, um, uh, there is no speed improve for a single process. Okay, in some cases that might even make it go slower because um, the more cores you have, the likelihood is the lower the clock speed for each core is going to be. Okay, so actually there's a trade-off between clock speed and number of cores. It's only useful if there's a large number of processes in your system. So if you've got one or two processes, having a quad-core or octa-core processor is pointless. Um, and not all processes need processing time. Okay, um, so what I mean by that is let's say you've got an update um, process which runs in the background, which maybe checks once a day, do, does this piece of software need an update? Well, that process can be idle for the whole time, uh, apart from that one time in the day where it will wake up, check the update, and go back to sleep again. So all those processes, even though you might have lots of them running, they may actually be doing absolutely nothing and just waiting for something to happen before they actually do anything. So um, that means that um, having a high number of multi uh, calls and lots of multitasking actually doesn't help uh, in those scenarios. So finally, um, time to make notes on multitasking, this idea of um, having multiple calls. So draw a CPU with maybe six or eight calls and then how could we allocate 14 processes over these six cores? Okay, draw in the diagram. This is just really to kind of give an indication of the idea that we might do scheduling, okay, using a single core, but actually if I have more than one core, those processes can be allocated uh, fairly using something called a load balancer. Explain how parallelism can be achieved when dealing with multiple processes. So this idea, rather than having a single process, which can break up into independent chunks, which then run in parallel, actually have lots and lots of processes, or even lots of requests coming in from um, uh, for a service on a server, um, how can I then fairly allocate those across my calls? Okay. 
then note down the advantage dispatches as was um, explained on the last slide.